Hi, this is Pete Lyons with Let's Play Salesforce. And in tonight's Einstein Analytics video, we are joined by guest Lizzie from Salesforce, who's going to show us everything you ever wanted to know and all the things that you didn't realize you wanted to know because you didn't know about them for Snowflake and Einstein Analytics. Lizzie, over to you. Thanks, Pete. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pretty crazy uh, new set of release notes that came out for the Winter 21 release. I know that there are a lot of eyeballs looking at those new Snowflake features that have been announced. And I'm excited to show some of those features that are in beta today uh, and also give you guys a little overview of how all of these pieces come together. So if you're looking at the old standard Snowflake connector and saying, well, isn't this good enough? Or you're looking at that new Snowflake Direct connector uh, that's currently in open beta or that output connector to write back into Snowflake, also in beta right now. Uh, how do you make the decision about which of these connectors you should use? So that's what I'm going to be talking with you guys through today and um, really looking forward to it. Okay, so first question that you might have, what already existed in terms of Snowflake functionality. Not everyone has used that traditional Snowflake connector. Uh, it's one of the top performing connectors that syncs data into Einstein Analytics. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do is highlight how you can actually use this connector today. Just hopping into Data Manager, you can see under the list of connectors, a variety of different standard connectors, uh, including of course, our Snowflake connection. Now to add a connection like this, it's just as simple as scrolling down, clicking on Snowflake, and filling out some basic information about your Snowflake account. Uh, now I've actually already done this in advance. I didn't wanna bore you guys with typing in my password. And so here you can actually see the finished connection that I built. And down below a table from Snowflake, now an object that I've synced into Einstein Analytics. Uh, important to note that you do need to run data sync in order to bring this in. So from here, uh, the traditional path would be to follow a recipe to start to bring that data together with your local Salesforce data uh, or perhaps a data flow and eventually surface that into a dashboard. So what would that actually look like? Uh, you could go into data prep, you could pull in your usage data. And this is just the table that we synced in. And one of the great things about this traditional connector is you do get the ability to modify this data once it's already sitting in Einstein. So whether you're gonna use a recipe, whether you're going to go in and use a data flow, uh, you actually have the ability to join data, to aggregate it, to do all of these things that you might do with some of these data prep features. For example, uh, bringing in data from Salesforce. So I've actually got just a little data set with some features of my accounts that we can pull together with this data that's coming out of Snowflake. Uh, in this example, everything that I'm showing is kind of a pretend usage data. So we've got our different products, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, and we've got counts as well as the total dollars spent. So we can join these things together and it's automatically paired these. And all of the usual stuff with a recipe, um, you get the functionality to be able to do something like create a calculated field, a formula that's adding up our spend on Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. And we'll just call this total spend USD. So from here, we could go in and output to create a new data set. And the value of this is you are really working with a data set that you built out using potentially all of these different other connectors that you have in Einstein Analytics. And I won't bore you guys by building out a full dashboard, but I did build one on the basis of this joined data. So here we have a sample dashboard that shows our total usage that we calculated and the ability to drill down by these different pieces. Um, one thing to note, this is actually a dashboard template, so this can be pretty easily achieved in a matter of minutes. 
Now, if you've been listening up until this point, you're probably thinking, this is all stuff we already knew. And that's true. Uh, this is not new functionality, but it's important to review what the standard Salesforce connector for Snowflake would do because uh, there are a lot of different considerations that you'll have when you start to evaluate which connector you should be using. Uh, I'd strongly advise, uh, don't just buy into hype and say, hey, this is the new connector, so it must be better. Um, you have to ask yourself, you know, do I have a real-time requirement that might require a direct query connector? Do I have really awesome uh, data flows and recipes? I've transformed my data in Einstein and it would be valuable to be able to share that information out into a Snowflake data warehouse? Uh, or do I just need to present analytics on Snowflake data in Einstein? And if the answer is just plain Jane analytics, a lot of times this standard connector is going to be your best bet. So with that disclaimer being said, let's move into some of the new stuff. How do you set up a connection using direct query? We can head back to our data manager here. And just like we had that standard connector set up, we can also go in and create a few other types of connections. So here we've got a live connection to Snowflake Direct. Again, this is the same deal. You're just entering some basic credentials. Uh, and there are a couple of setup steps you should keep in mind. So in order to be able to see this tab, uh, you're going to need to go into your settings and activate the query external data using uh, Einstein Analytics. So that sits in your analytics settings under setup. And uh, be aware for now, this is a beta feature. It's an open beta, meaning that if you wanted to go into your own environment and have an admin turn that on today, uh, it is available to you, but it's not yet GA. And where does this wind up? Once you've turned it on and you've given your user access to that direct query, it's going to appear in a list here in Analytics Studio is a new type of asset called Live Data. And when we click into that specific table, here we're able to start creating a lens. Now you may ask, what if I wanna build this into a dashboard? And the answer is uh, currently the way that this connector works, you will do your building of your queries in a lens and then you'll clip them to a dashboard to build these out. So if we wanted to take a look at our total sum of alpha usage in dollars, and uh, you can also, I think that you may have missed it, but you can see that uh, the data set that I'm working with here is a little over 200, 150,000 rows. So um, let's go and click on our alpha usage and then break that down by region, just to make a really simple visualization to illustrate the point. And I'll give that a sort and clip it onto the dashboard builder. So now we've got this in designer and there's one more piece that I'm going to generate. Right now, the way that you would filter um, in an embedded dashboard is using a filter string. And so um, one really clever way that you can do that is by including a query that has the field that you want to filter by. So I'm going to include an accounts query as well. And just build out the world's most simple <laughs> dashboard. We're not going to be too fancy with it. And I'm also going to add a canvas and this is going to include our, our details of the individual accounts. Oop. I actually want to stick that onto a list widget, make it look a little cleaner. All right, hit save. And so now we've built out the world's potentially most boring <laughs> dashboard, but this is working directly off of data that is sitting in a Snowflake instance, which is pretty exciting. 
Uh, and you can see a lot of these load times were pretty good as we were starting to work through building this in the lens, even as we were breaking it down by a pretty, uh, pretty detailed dimension. And so now let's move into what the experience looks like when we embed. So here I am in the same environment and I'm looking at our account AccuTherm and I'm just going to take some of these dashboards that we've built out so far and embed them in the page. Now, one thing that I'll often see customers do is add kind of an account 360 intelligence tab onto these list of tabs here. So I'm going to go into our lightning tabs, build out one with a custom name and make that our account 360. And for this one, let's include just that standard dashboard that I showed you before that is built out as the result of the recipe, um, bringing data from Snowflake into, uh, into Einstein Analytics. Great, so here that is sitting on the account record. And of course, uh, a lot of you guys are gonna be familiar with how you might filter this. In my case, uh, the data set that I have flowing through has my account name that matches up with the account name that's on the object. Best practice would be to use an ID, uh, but in my case, I will have to use the name. And there we go. Now it's specific data for AccuTherm. The process is a little different when you're using direct query. So the way that it works right now is you can drag and drop just the same and you can see it's already on top of it. We know that we want my let's play dashboard in here and let's just make that fit the size of the dashboard a little better. And you will notice there's a little bit more of a load time. Obviously this data is not sitting in the Salesforce cloud, uh, but it is sitting in a very performant data store. So from here, what we're going to do is uh, add a filter. And what you'll need to do is take something a little bit like this. And I've got a sample here in Quip of the filter string that I'm going to use. It's just identifying the name of the step that I'm going to use, uh, as well as the name of the grouping and the value that I'm taking from the record. So I believe I may have called this thing accounts instead of account, might be worth a check. And you can see here it's accounts underscore one. So just those little details that it's good to check in on. Copy and paste that in as a filter string. And unless I fat fingered this, I think, there we go. So now we can see that this particular customer has lower usage of alpha and APAC. So now that we've finished embedding this in the dashboard or in the uh, account view, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how you might make the decision, which of your visualizations are actually going to be based on real-time data from your data warehouse and uh, which of them are going to be based on data that you have synced in. A couple of the considerations I outlined so far, obviously if you want to transform the data once it's in Einstein, you're going to need to actually move it in there. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that you can combine these on the same visualization. So whether you uh, want to have a dashboard that includes some real-time elements from Snowflake but also has some data that you've brought in from it or other sources. Uh, you can use bindings against a direct query, so that's a great way to uh, improve the way that it interacts with other widgets and other queries that are on the dashboard. 
Uh, it's also about the question of how current the data needs to be. So there's a lot of configurability with a standard connector uh, to sync data in at the frequency that you need. Uh, if you have a real-time requirement where you truly need it to be up to the second within the data warehouse, uh, that's a really great use case for something like direct query. I also see a lot of customers use it to expo explore larger amounts of data that they might not typically bring into the Einstein data store. We've gone through two of the connectors now, the one that already existed, uh, the one that's in open beta, which is our direct query connector. And the very last one is the, the connector that would uh, actually put data back into Snowflake, the output connector. So for that, let's take a look at a Snowflake environment for a moment. This is my own Snowflake environment, and I've built a table called Salesforce that's meant to bring some of this data back from our Einstein Analytics environment. And you can see this table has a variety of different columns, account, region, all the different spend, but also some of the details that we have normally in Sales Cloud. So our industry, the name of our opportunity, the account type, and so on. And you can also see that there's no data in here right now. I've run a couple of tests, but right now this table is empty. So we'll use that as our test to see how the output connector works. Moving into data manager again, I have the world's most simple uh, recipe 3.0. So this is a uh, recipes 3.0 beta uh, data preparation tool. And uh, we've got our data coming out of our accounts, out of our usage data, joining together, uh, and finally going to our output. Oh, and of course we get a bunch of unknowns here. We it's wouldn't beta. That wasn't the case. <laughs> gotta love the betas. It's fine. We we know we know Tim's gonna finish it off real nice before before it goes GA. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm definitely a big fan. This is one of my favorite um, beta features, recipes 3.0. Yeah, I've been waiting for this for oh, like three and a half years. I think because there was um, just so many things that needed to be built up before we were ready for it. I mean, it, and it's like the data flow engines, you know, been around since like, well, since edge, edge spring and we, we got the UI as kind of a temporary holdover, but it was always the plan to kind of rebuild the engine. Um, and I'm just, I'm amazed with the final output. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel the same way. And one of the really nice things that I noticed when I was testing out this output connector is that it actually auto completes. If you have similar names between your recipe output field and the field that you have in your table in Snowflake, uh, it'll actually match these up for you. So uh, here, basically what you do, instead of selecting to write to a data set, you can choose to go to your output connection, select that connection name, and then pick your specific table. And I named my table Salesforce. And then here, because these match up roughly, you know, it, there are some caps. It looks like it may have gotten Charlie and Bravo mixed up. We can fix that. But here, uh, it's really easily matched up all of our different fields so we can start to move this data back in, just hit apply. And uh, this is also not a whole ton of data I'm moving. I'm actually using my, my own Snowflake account right now. Um, so it's just gonna be a little transfer, but I think it illustrates the idea pretty well. All you gotta do is hit run and then we can go back. Ooh. we'll go back to the data manager to monitor that job. And there we are with our final refresh uh, in a little bit under a minute, uh, we've brought in that data to Snowflake, but don't take it from the data monitor, let's take it from Snowflake itself. So here you can see the power of that output connector uh, currently in beta that's coming in that next winter release for GA. Uh, we've got all this information coming in. Uh, this was stuff that we put together in a recipe in, in Einstein Analytics. And now all the value of that data set that you've prepared can be shared out across the organization. So uh, a lot of really great ways for 
uh, organizations to make smart decisions about where data should sit, uh, how to best meet the requirements of your end users who are working in Sales Cloud and Service Cloud and all of Salesforce platform every day. Um, and with that, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to Q&A. All right, so first, that was awesome. I'm super pumped. I'm also kind of jealous because none of my clients uh, have, have given me the green light to go and start building this sort of thing yet. Uh, but I really want to get under the hood of it and, and do it myself. So real time for me is, it, it's just, it's, uh, it's a very double-edged sword. And I've presented at Dreamforce and I've, um, you know, uh, done it on my channel about the how and why. And really, the, the reason why I'm kind of hesitant to ever like talk about it or use it is because in most cases, real time isn't actually necessary, especially with uh, sub hourly data flows now. But there are most definitely use cases when it is appropriate. And I love to see the approaches and the different tactics that we have expanding. And just we're always growing that arsenal. Um, to be able to tackle those edge cases that we would otherwise have to say, well, sorry, can't do it. Um, so first thought, and this isn't actually a question for you. It's a question for Ed. Why can recipes, recipes have a histogram on the field. Why can't I have a histogram? Ed, why can't I have a histogram? Uh, next, I, I just want to point out, I, um, and I, I know this is the, uh, if I had to guess, it was probably Eddie's idea, but we have uh, excellent use of pages on that template to expand and collapse sections. Uh, I was literally working with one of my teammates today and trying to show him how to bring the bling. And we were watching uh, Eddie's video on Vimeo, which I will put a link in the description. I always say that, but I, I seldom do. Uh, but it's just a really great video on, on uh, you know, to, to get to get your brainstorming about different ways to leverage pages to uh, help deliver more digestible uh, and aesthetically pleasing dashboards. Um, so my first real question, uh, I noticed when you were exploring the data set in the lens editor that uh, I'm seeing all of these API names. They've, they're, they're, they're in caps. I imagine there's probably underscores floating around somewhere. Is there an XMD? Is there a way for us to have a field API name and a field label? Probably not, no? No, uh, so the way that it currently works, you are working right against the connection. There is no data set. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it out there whether that's something that changes, but the, the fact of the matter is right now, if you open this up and open beta today and you want to make an edit to how something is appearing, uh, the, the only real configurability that you get is uh, editing the dashboard JSON. And you, you get everything that you could do with dashboard JSON, but you don't get any XMD, you don't get a data set. Um, and that also impacts the way you would manage permissions. So the way that you would use uh, direct query, uh, typically what you do is create several different sets of credentials uh, that have access to different views on the Snowflake side. And uh, you can sort those into different apps. Uh, live connections can be sorted into apps when you create them. That's how you manage permissions with direct query. Yeah, and it's reasonable that you can't like have every possible angle of it in the world. Um, but to that end, you know, we can bind in, we can bind out. So theoretically, if you needed to uh, leverage an XMD, what I've actually done is use row bindings and increment a variable in it and then union everything together to basically strip out. Um, I've done this with SQL queries where you run a SQL query and you strip out row by row by row and then you union it all back together to basically leverage a, uh, an analytics data sets XMD um, on this. So if we have bindings and we can pull values out of them where there's a will and a, uh, and a little bit of stubborn determination, there's potentially a way. I think there um, might be a stubborn determination on this call, and I'm not sure if it's me. <laughs> <laughs> just a bit, just a bit. No, I mean, so I'm always looking for ways to experiment with stuff. Um, I don't actually have a use case, I mean, for that, really. At the end of the day, if we can get the data on the screen, that's minimal viable product, that, that makes me happy. But what about, uh, can we leverage connected data sources to facet without bindings, or do we need to use bindings? Uh, so if you're pulling in data from the same from the same connection or the same table, 
uh, you should be able to facet within those. So if I had created multiple queries, kind of like how I did with the, the list widget, um, mm -hmm. that was faceting between the same data set, or I guess the same live connection in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to cross facet, right now that's bindings. Uh, okay. So if you had a data set sitting in Einstein and a direct query and you wanted those to facet together, that's bindings. Well, we still have a path forward, so that's just fine. Um, also, what's the experience like, and I don't even know if, if, if there, I don't, I, I, I don't recall whether I did or didn't see the button, but with SQL queries um, and Salesforce Direct, when you flip over to code mode, you see a SQL query as opposed to a SQL query. Is that just locked out entirely or is it in a different language? Uh, it, it's in SQL, but it's not available to edit. So freeform SQL is something that uh, our product team is considering. Uh, might be worth keeping an eye open for updates on that later in the later in the, I guess, product development. <laughs> yeah, and I'm under the I'm I'm under the impression that eventually uh, Data Prep 3.0 is going to support SQL or it is intended. But again, for anybody watching, hashtag Safe Harbor. This is commentary, not documentation. So please make purchasing decisions based on what you have today. Talk to your AE if you're in doubt. Um, but then. Uh, yeah, another another thing I just wanted to point out. I noticed that the uh, the there was some some structural differences with our filter syntax. So I always like to you know go lazy mode, let analytics do the work for me when possible. So for example, I never just start writing a SQL query free for, freehand. I'll usually try to take a compare table as far as I can go and then use that as the basis for my SQL. When I have to do uh, custom filter expressions, I'll usually start with the filter builder, swip, switch over to string, borrow that code out. But I noticed that this syntax is completely different. So my assumption would be that once the, 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 the connector's out, once the release notes are published, we'll probably just have a syntax example there to borrow from. Uh, it, I think that it'll, it'll depend. So right now, the way that it works is you would use the filter string, but, uh, the eventual plan is that you are going to have that same ability to click into, uh, the filter editor and add them using the same kind of technology that I showed when we were using the standard connector. So, uh, the other thing is the syntax of that filter string is actually standard and already in documentation right now. Uh, oh, I thought it it's got it had the word groups in it. I thought it was I thought the structure was slightly different. Usually it's like data set name, I think the word fields. It was the word group that threw me for a loop. Huh. I might be wrong. Uh yeah, it's possible that I I, I made an edit to the standard filter string that was different. I had to test around with it a little bit to make it work. Yeah. Um, but it could also it could also be an example where there's multiple parameters that are acceptable. Um, but yeah, I mean that the structure of it looked the same with the exception that instead of the word field, we had the word group. And I've also seen that when like, um, you know, like you have that at the bottom of uh, SQL steps um, in the, the dashboard JSON and, and it's, it's structured out a little bit differently. And it's, there's definitely a bit of, of a learning curve to figure out well, what does it want? And you got to just try this, try that, try that, you know? So I, I can imagine it'll, it'll take a little bit of time, but you know, anything worth it is going to take, take a little bit of effort. And I think that if your clients have, or, or if you're a customer, if you have uh, a, a need for this, this is going to be an amazing feature. And, you know, I never try to be all judgy McJudgerson about things that are, you know, pilots, betas, et cetera, or even just the first release of GA because you gotta basically get it out there, get it in the hands of the people, then the, the clients are the ones who are actually gonna show us what's working right, what are they using the most, and the product team is amazing about gathering that feedback to find what is the next iteration gonna be. Yeah, absolutely, and we're already getting really great feedback from people who are participating in data programs or have started to use that direct query in open data. So uh, our PMs definitely have uh, their schedules filled and plenty of ideas for how to take these forward and make them really great. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just one last question. Uh, what are we talking in terms of limits, row caps, uh, sinks per day? And, and this is to both. Uh, so I would assume that the, uh, the non-live connector 
is subject to the standard limits of uh, 50 pulls a day, 50 gigabytes a day, um, though whatever's in documentation, those standard limitations. Um, but what are the number of maximum number of rows we can have with a connected object? And what's the maximum number of rows we can pull with a live query? Um, you know, assuming that we've, we've filtered down to whatever we want. Uh, I am blanking on this one. I, I need to look at documentation. Okay. There's numbers. It's out there somewhere. The link will probably not be posted in the description because I always forget that until someone calls me out on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can follow up and put the link in the description for you. <laughs> All like, right. Add a comment or something. All right. Uh, well, looks like that's all we have for tonight. Um, Lizzie, I want to thank you again for coming out. Um, I literally can't provide this content myself because I don't have a Snowflake account. So thank you very much for uh, sharing with the audience. And to you folks at home, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, tell a friend. And as always, thanks for watching.